analytics. Analytics is the discovery, interpretation, communication of meaningful patterns in data. It relies on the simultaneous application of statistics, computer programming, and operations research. What we do is we take a lot of data and we make some sense out of it. And to do that requires a lot of horsepower and a lot of math. And, and fortunately, I work with some really smart people that are really good at math. So let's talk about some tasks that we love to do as part of cybersecurity. So I, I'm assuming everybody in here's got some interest or some relation to cybersecurity. So if you're a CISO, how much do you love doing risk reporting and documentation? Yeah? OK. SOC analysts, you guys love working with manual correlation. So I've got to go from tool to tool to tool to tool to tool and try to make sense of what the heck's going on. Um, if I'm an incident responder, I just I love getting that false positive because it really makes my day. Um, I, you know, I, I really like spending my time chasing things that aren't real. Um, if I'm a security administrator, patching. Ah, it's one of my favorites. Security engineers love maintaining that, that server infrastructure. Um, the application security engineer loves talking about threat modeling and requirements. I'm, I'm sure of it. And then the network forensic expert loves querying network traffic data. And then, good thing there aren't any tomatoes in here, because I think everybody loves working with auditors. So I spend a lot of time as an auditor, so I'm, I'm OK. You all can throw stuff at me. It's fine. Um, but if we take a look at this and we say, OK, we have gobs of data that live somewhere in our environment, and we can start to make some sense with it, we can help in a lot of these tasks that people hate to do. And that's the goal that I see for analytics. And that's what I see as being really helpful. So we'll talk a little bit more about analytics. So all right, by show of hands, how many people heard of machine learning today? Just today, at least six times. <laughs> I think everybody's talked about machine learning. Everybody's talked, maybe some people have heard about deep learning, and I think everybody's talked about AI. You guys know that they all play off each other. They all interrelate. And you've got to start with your data and your architecture before you can do anything else. Once you have your data set, then you can start to run some math against it. Statistics. It's, it's really the core of what we do for analytics. From statistics, we can start to look at building machine learning models. And those models can help us get better and faster and, and do things more uh, effectively. From machine learning, we can take multiple machine learning models, package them together, and do deep learning or cognitive computing. And so it's that, that integration of multiple models together, working together, that gets us to the point where we can do some deep learning. And then from deep learning, then we can move into artificial intelligence. So we've got a lot of building blocks and foundational things that we can start from. And as we go up the, the, the chain, things get more complex. So I want you to know I talked about machine learning, deep learning, and AI. I, I hit at least three of the columns in the buzzword bingo card. But let's talk a little bit more about it. machine learning. How many people have heard about machine learning, but are still going, the heck does that mean? And, and what, is that, what are we doing with it? So with machine learning, we're going to take known data and known responses. We're going to model what that's supposed to look like. And then from that model, we're going to take that new data in and see if we can learn from it, see if it meets our model. We're going to test that new data against the model and make sure that things are still working the way we expect them to. And if there is something different, then we're going to update that model with the new data. So this is pretty neat. And you know, machines do things a lot faster than human beings do. So this is pretty cool. Well, let me ask, you know, I, I was out in Vegas last week, and, and we talked a lot about adversarial machine learning. Anybody have any idea what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's an example. But what we 
we're starting to see also are people are doing adding uh, information into your known data to corrupt your model. So just like you, we went down the signature path with, well, everything, um, you could simply change that a little bit, and now all of a sudden your signature wasn't useful anymore. Well, if I can inject data into your model, I can now corrupt that machine learning model. So, you know, something to ask, as everyone's talking about machine learning, what are you doing to protect your machine learning uh, known data and known responses? So that was a, a really interesting thing that we talked about last week. All right, so from machine learning, we talk about deep learning. And deep learning, it's really a type of machine learning. Um, it trains a computer to perform human-like tasks, such as recognizing speech, identifying images, or making predictions. Instead of organizing data to run through predefined equations, deep learning sets up basic parameters about the data and trains the computer to learn on its own by recognizing patterns. So lots of different models associated with deep learning. You, you have feed forward, um, where you're, you're continuing to move forward, you, and you continue to learn in that forward fashion. You have recurrent neural networks, which essentially you're, you're spinning around, um, and each pass through, you learn more, and then things get really complicated, and, and I'll let my di data science folks talk about that if there's any really deep questions on that. Um, but again, deep learning is really an iteration of machine learning, and, and it's really a, a greater enhancement of... Uh... So from there, we talk about artificial intelligence. So it, we're now we're taking natural language processing and understanding, we're combining that with deep learning and machine learning, and we're able to start making predictions. We're starting to make value judgments. Um, we're starting to comprehend what's happening in our data. Um, interaction, reasoning, sensory, logic, attention, image recognition. Um, how many people have seen some of the image recognition um, systems that are out there? Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to work with some of the stuff that IBM was doing uh, around cancer research. And it was pretty amazing that they could look at an image and see was the cell cancerous or not cancerous. And they could look at a lot of images and, and let the machine do a lot of that work and start to make those predictions. So, so that's a little bit about artificial intelligence. All right, so some myths around analytics. It can be done quickly. Nah. It's not easy. Um, framing the problem and preparing the data takes time and insight. Analytics will solve all of your problems. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, all of these things are gonna solve every problem that we have. It's our next silver bullet. Well, not all problems can be solved by analytics. Some problems are better solved by analytics than others. Um, cleaning and preparing data for analysis are easy tasks. All right, I have to ask my data scientist. <laughs> no, working with our data is, is a huge mess. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we talk about some of the models that are out there, that some of the architectures that are coming out for um, security operations. Um, machine learning is devoid of human intervention. Once we set it up, we can forget about it, and it's fire and forget. It's not. We need to continue to look at how our machine learning is effective, how it's being used, how it's working, and how often does it continue to learn? And then machine learning can produce results from any data in any situation. Again, we keep hearing these buzzwords, machine learning, AI. It, it's not the magic bullet. It isn't there. Now, there's some really amazing uses of it, but we need to be careful and, and have a healthy dose of skepticism about what we're hearing. All right. So, hype from reality. Some questions you want to ask somebody who's saying, we do machine learning and, and we do AI. How often does your machine mo learning model actually learn? If you build a model and let it stagnate, well, how good are your results going to be out of it? <laughs> how, how accurate is your machine learning model? Again, this is all based on math. And so if your math is wrong, you're going to have skewed results coming out of your model. You're going to have skewed predictions coming out of 
the, 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 the results coming from uh, your machine learning. Is your machine learning model diagnostic or predictive? What do you think it should be? It should be diagnostic because you're, you're feeding data into it. You're continuing to learn from the data that you're already seeing. If it's predictive, well, that's interesting. How'd you get to that prediction? These are questions, again, you want to ask somebody who's telling you, Machine learning is, you know, we built this into our product. This is what we want to show you. This is, this is why you should buy our solution. Um, and then we talked a little bit about this. What do you do to protect your machine learning model from adversaries? Again, if I can corrupt your machine learning model, if I can corrupt the data that your model's learning from, I can then influence what that system does. It's not good. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about the evolution of analytics and, and cybersecurity. So I've been in this business way too long. Um, we started a long time ago with log management. We, we had this requirement to review logs. It became a compliance requirement, but it was good practice. So we said, let's put all of our logs in a centralized location. So we brought logs together. We call this a descriptive analytics, because mostly what we're trying to figure out is what happened, you know? It, we, we did it for hysterical purposes. We, we had a compromise, we had a data breach. How did this happen? Where, when did they get in and what did they get? Then from there, we added correlation to our log management and, and the SIM market was born. Here, we now added a little bit of predictive analytics about, hey, what could happen? So, you know, if I start to correlate and I start to look at, hmm, maybe my vulnerability information and my uh, log information and my asset information, maybe now I can say, wow, I, I, maybe I have some vulnerabilities here that I need to patch because I am actually seeing attacks against it. Um, so, we're moving into this next, this last block here that takes SIM and adds analytics and maybe a little bit of orchestration to it. And here we're looking at proactive and prescriptive analytics. Can we prevent it and what should we do about it? And this is really interesting because this is sort of that next chapter of where we're heading in security. You'll see two things here. You'll, you'll see Gartner. Um, Gartner has come out with something called SOAR which is the security operations, analytics, and reporting model. Um, if you're a Gartner fan, I'll show that to you. Um, but ESG's come out with one that I, I think is a little bit more interesting for me because it aligns with something that we've been doing for a really long time. So uh, ESG came out with SOPA, and it's Security Operations Analytics Platform Architecture. And it's a, I'll show you that too, so let's get to it. Um, this is SOAR. So it talks about detection, assessment, response, and mitigation. It brings things from your vulnerability assessment, your SIM, your threat and vulnerability management, your security incident response, and your security operations analytics. Brings that all together and, and starts to make some sense out of it. Again, it's a reporting model, so you're getting more events, maybe with some better fidelity, but um, everybody works in security and we need another event like we need a hole in the head. We got enough to do as it is. But SOPA is interesting. SOPA actually looks at, this is adapted from, from the ESG uh, SOPA model that they have, but we, we talk about security silos and data sources. And I, I love the quote for analytics that data is the fuel for analytics. So we got a lot of data at cybersecurity. So boundary protection, that's your firewalls, your IPSs, um, and anything else that we use or create information from. Uh, your internal network, your, your switches, um, and internal uh, network sensors, endpoint detect protection, so your EDR systems, your antivirus, uh, other sources. Identity and authentication. Um, I think everybody's seen some of the folks that are upstairs. You've got Cellpoint doing identity and authentication. Uh, endpoint, I saw Tanium up there. Um, boundary protection and network access control. I think I saw a Forescout up there. You got more products than you can throw a stick at. And 
I, you know, at RSA this year, I think I saw more vendors than I've ever seen before in my life. And, and I couldn't tell whether I was, whether they were trying to sell or, or whether they were just trying to be acquired. We'll talk about that too. I, I felt like it was in the shark tank. Um, <laughs> then you've got behavioral analytics, threat intelligence, and a bunch of other, just a ton of data. Well, so in the SOPA model, we take all those sources and we bring them into a common data layer. And that, in that layer, we're going to do aggregation. We're going to do deduplication because, you know, if we're going to do analytics, if we have more of the same thing over and over and over again, it's going to skew our analytics. This, by the way, is where we do that data prep. And we said that wasn't easy. It's not. Uh, we do enrichment. It's where we start to bring together and normalize different data and, and start to say, okay, well, how do I want to look at this machine? And what information is available for this machine, whether it's network or threat, or, or, or maybe I want to look at the end user. Well, what machine is that end user, uh, what machine is that end user interacting with? Um, and then the very last one here, it's hard to see, it's, it's compression and encryption. And I like that because it really enables us to do something really unique, which is, let's put that on-prem. Let's take the rest of this stuff and move it somewhere else. So maybe we can do this in the cloud. Um, software service and integration layer. This is really a message bus. Um, it's your transaction processing. I've seen a lot of folks use Kafka to do this. Um, if you want to do it open source, there you go. Um, and then you move from there into your analytics layer. So you've done all of your data management and all your data prep at this lower le level. So if anybody's a Star Trek fan, I, I use the color scheme. So here's your security layer, your science layer, and then your command and control layer. Um, sorry, I just had to geek out on everyone for just a second. Exactly, exactly, no. See, this is where you're supposed to throw a tomato at me or something, okay? Uh, but yes, usually the red shirts die first. But um, it, it just made sense. So you've got your science layer, you've got your analytics processing layer. You can do lots of different things here. Um, but then as you move up to that data visualization and operationalization, um, well, now we can do some really cool things. If, if I can actually say with better assurance that some event is actually really a threat, then I can do something about it. And you know, I think I heard the, um, the keynote speaker talking about, well, we don't necessarily need to kill the whole box, we just kill that portion of it. But if you think about your incident response programs, you really only have a couple of things that you do. You try and quarantine the files that are misbehaving. If that doesn't work, you quarantine the whole box. If that doesn't work, you re-image that box. But from an incident response program, as long as you're just kind of focusing on that core, how do I stop that behavior? Try and fix it, try and isolate it, well, replace it. It's really that simple. And if you can simplify it that much, well, why the hell can't we automate it? And we've had tools out there that automate this for a long time. We just don't know how to tell those tools what to do. So maybe this is a model that can help us get there. Um, we were talking about, I, uh, okay, here we go. Another buzzword for y'all. We were talking about Petya um, and some of the things that have been running rampant lately. Um, and I think we, we set a time horizon to about seven minutes before one organization was completely taken down. Well, how much time do we spend researching an event, finding an incident? Well, if the bad guys have gotten to the point where they're automating their attacks, and those attacks are capable of taking out an organization within seven minutes, maybe we need to improve our defense mechanisms. Maybe we need to look at that same model and see how do we automate our response. And folks, we've been doing this in, say, like the credit card industry for a long time. I put my credit card in, it sends up, gets authorized, it's either you know, approved or declined, or maybe sometimes they say, are you really sure you want to do this? Well, Maybe that's what we need to start thinking about in cybersecurity. And you have different threat profiles for different people in your organization. But maybe it's, hey, you know, you're doing something bad, let's shut you down. You know, if you're a high-level person or you have access to critical information, maybe we need to 
get faster with our automation. So this is um, SOPA. I kind of like it. I think it's pretty neat. Um, from an analytics perspective, I'm, my background has been in cybersecurity. I, I came to SAS about two years ago. I saw a really huge need for analytics in the cybersecurity market space. Um, you know, I've, I've watched security sort of um, adopt different technologies. I remember when I first started, everybody was talking about viruses. And so let's look, talk about how immunology works and epidemiology. And so we took that information and then we said, okay, well, the threats moved from the perimeter to the application. So let's learn more about application programming. And, and so security continues to advance. And I see that next advancement as really being in the analytics space. All right. So a good security talk doesn't exist without talking about the cyber kill chain. Again, I told you all it was going to be a buzzword talk. I don't care about the cyber kill chain. I care about it from a reference point because what I want to do is I want to talk about the difference between indicators of compromise, which is where we've lived for a really, really long time, and how do we shift to indicators of attack. And I'm setting you up, Pankaj. <laughs> because, for instance, if we can look at what is an indicator of attack, that means I can get ahead of a compromise. By the time we're looking at an indicator of a compromise, the breach has already happened. My system's already done. I've, I've already lost data. I'm already having to report to the board or to, to my regulators. So maybe if I start looking at what are indicators of attack and reshift my focus, I can move further up that kill chain and, and kill this problem before it ever becomes an issue in my organization. So with that, let's talk a little bit about industry acquisitions and, and motives. So all of this sounds really cool, sounds really pie in the sky, blue sky type stuff. Um, we're doing it. IBM bought resilient systems. They're automating incident response. Splunk bought Caspedia, same, same routine. Microsoft bought Hexadite. If you don't know Hexadite, Hexadite had an automated orchestrated response system. Microsoft's in, in, incorporating that into their next um, active defense um, uh, application. And um, Hewlett Packard bought Nayara, which is more on the behavioral analytics. But, but you're seeing all of these big players in, in IT and in security acquiring these interesting technologies. The one that was most interesting for me was Hexadite. They did that automatic analysis and they automatically started to fix the problems that they saw, whether it was applying a patch, cutting off network access, or something. It did that orchestration. And so if you think this isn't the way we're headed, the folks that have a lot of money, they're already heading there. So with that, I'm done. Any questions? Was this useful? Something different. With that, I'll turn it over to Pankaj, which, if there are no questions, I think I'm finished a lot earlier than I thought I would be. Um, I'm open. What do you guys think? Where do you see the industry headed? Okay. I mean, we've got to get, you know, we talk about dwell times and how long, mean time to respond. Um, and and they're, they're huge. You know, you're talking about something being existing on your network or in your enterprise for, for months before you detect it. And it's not a matter of if, it's really that discussion of when. Um, what else? What about automation and our orchestration? I, I said some pretty challenging things out here and you know, I'm flying in the face of many of, of the industry, but thoughts? Well, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes you need to sit there and, and, and let it play out. But maybe there are ways for us to do that where we mitigate the damage. Because we are seeing malware that, that is smart. You know, if, if all of a sudden if a piece of malware sees that it's in a containment area, it shuts down. It doesn't actually do, it doesn't execute what it, it would have its payload. It has two or three different payloads. And so if it's looking at 
hey, I, I'm looking at uh, a honeypot or something. It, it said, no, nah, okay. <sighs> From a non-honeypot to begin with to redirect it, I haven't seen anything like that. It would be interesting, though. Yeah, it would be really challenging to, to kind of say, okay, but we redirect it. Um, what we're looking at is, you know, if we can see what those behaviors are, we can redirect things accordingly. Um, and we've got the technology to do that, whether we, we change a route, whether we, we do some DNS spoofing, whatever that is. Um, we, can, we can do that in our systems. Um, thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Please, yes, sir. Yeah. So let's let's pull that apart a little bit. Let's talk about the network, for instance. Um, I, I like I said, I was out in Vegas last week. I saw Chris Young speak. Chris is the CEO of McAfee, and and he's talked about. He pulled out his crystal ball and looked at the future, and he said, you know, we're going to change our emphasis, and we're going to look at cloud, and we're going to look at endpoint, but we're going to stop looking so much at network, because what they find is that the network's really a transport layer. And most of the stuff that we transport is encrypted. So it's not like we can really see a lot of what's happening. And as we move to these cloud infrastructures, our data is leaving our building, our, our premise. So, so how much emphasis do we put in the network? But I do agree that there is some re-architecture, rethinking around how we would build our, our networks. Um, most of your Cisco routers today have the ability to black hole uh, a device. So it may just be as simple as say, hey, let's just send that command to that router and black hole that device for, for a little bit until we can figure out what's going on. Um, the intent here is not to have to reinvent the things that we've done. The intent here is to use the things that we already have spent money on and use them a lot better and make them more effective. Um, the, the last thing I hate when I, I, I've been doing consulting for 25 years, the last thing I hate is talking to a, cons talking to a client and saying, we need to rip out everything and start over. Because that usually, you know, goes, thanks, nice to talk to you, have a nice day. Um, but I find that we get much better approval from how do we leverage what you've already spent money on? How do we make that better? And how, you know, I find a lot of folks have spent a ton of money on security. Um, but we don't necessarily always make the best use of those investments. So how do we bring those investments together? And, and then the industry itself is at fault for this. My EDR system doesn't talk to my uh, threat system. My vulnerability management system doesn't talk to my um, SIM. You know, you're seeing a lot of those integrations happen now, but None of them were designed really to play, to get, play well together. And you can start to look at you know, vendors that have, hey, I do everything, but then how good are they really at that? Because I, I find that you know, people that have a greater focus in a specific area maybe have come across some innovation that others haven't. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry about my joke. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the audit world with you, so um, they all hated me too. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. As a security person, we don't want to get in the way of production either. That, that's like the death of our career. I don't know if you saw my alphabet soup at the top, but I, I understand controls very well. Um, yeah, yeah, you've got you've got a slightly different need, 
that needs to be addressed. And, and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the religious argument about compliance versus security at some other point. Well, maybe that'll be my talk next year. Um, but from a compliance perspective, we see this, um, the federal government's trying to do this now. Um, with the, the way they've done compliance uh, against uh, FISMA, you, you, you're looking at maybe a two-year cycle of, of revalidating the control set against that, that system. Well, now they want to do it continuously. And so for some controls, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe if I'm looking at you know, application logs or, or you know, um, authentication information, so are you really using complex passwords? I can automate that control pretty easily. Um, looking at, you know, do I have a fire suppression system and has it been tested last year? That doesn't really bear, doesn't, it's important, but doesn't really bear um, automation. So some of the more technical controls I can see being very easily automated. And again, if you position your questions correctly, you can do that with the data that's available. And so I do think that there's a huge aspect here where we can get into continuous authorization or continuous monitoring for security controls. I'd love to talk more about that. <laughs> it's something near and dear to my heart. I've done way too much FISMA work in my life. Anything else? This is for you guys. Yeah. OK, where's the tomato? <laughs> All right, there it is. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks for indulging me and uh, listening to my rant about uh, where we can head with security analytics. Thank you.